Um, first, we just say welcome and thank you for Mark for presenting at the iMOOT. I think this might be your first time you're presenting, is that right? Um, a number of years ago, I presented, co presented with a colleague. Right. Yes, I had seen your name, but yes. So it's fabulous to have you back. That's absolutely brilliant. And um, we're really looking forward to this today. And it's fabulous to have somebody from Ireland because we get quite a few people from um, the mainland Europe, but not Ireland. So it's fabulous to have somewhere different um, for us presenting today. Mark, I'll hand it over to you and you can tell your audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, no problem. Um, uh, uh, Doug and Wendy said mainland Europe. I always thought Ireland was mainland Europe and everybody else was the, on the fringes, but that's neither here nor there. Maybe that's the Irish ego in me coming through. But uh, thank you very much for this invitation, Wendy. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to um, sharing what we've done in Dublin City University. Oh, somebody speaking Irish and everything. Thanks, Joyce, very much. I'm, I'm so impressed. Um, so uh, to give you a little bit of personal background, my name is Mark Lynn. Uh, you'll see me down there, the second person on the list. We, uh, I work for DCU. I head up the teaching and learning unit, actually called the Teaching Enhancement Unit in, in Dublin City University. Uh, I do appreciate everybody has different labels for pretty much the same role in their own institution. So um, my responsibilities cover everything from staff development to um, course design, helping uh, staff to design blended learning courses, and of course, manage the IT technology, Moodle being one of the primary ones that's there, but managing the, the, the learning technologies, not obviously the whole IT infrastructure. We have a super IT team for that. Um, what I want to talk to you today about it is a learning analytics project. And um, the learning analytics project we looked at, we are doing a number of projects uh, related to learning analytics, and I will will touch on some of them later. But specifically, the core of this presentation is about Moodle data and how we use Moodle data within Dublin City University. So hopefully, you find it uh, find it useful. What I will probably do, if it's okay with you guys, is I will um, go through the slides relatively quickly and then open it up for discussion because I think that's where the power really comes in is in the, the questions and answers afterwards. You will see my Twitter handle down there uh, at the bottom at Glenn Mark. Feel free to tweet us at any stage. I'd be delighted to answer any questions. We operate on a, on a, a very open policy in uh, DCU. Uh, so we're more than willing to share wherever we can, uh, whatever we can and wherever we can. Um, and we'd be delighted to set up collaborative uh, research projects between our organization and yours if that is of interest to you. Okay, so just kicking off uh, what we're doing, we're talking about, as I said, student data within, within Moodle. This project was a, a collaborative project. I can't take credit for it whatsoever. Um, Owen is our PhD student who actually crunched all the numbers and did all the, the, the heavy lifting, for want of a better term. Ashleen is our institutional researcher and was, at, at the time, she's got a great promotion now, but at the time she was helping us crunch the numbers and match it to other institutional data. And then Alan is the, um, the powerhouse behind our data analytics center. And Sinead is uh, one of the lecturers that's uh, one of the psychology lecturers in our School of Nursing. And everybody's roles will become quite clear um, throughout the presentation. But that just gives you an overview. That's, that's the team as we stand. And um, here, I'm just looking at the comments here on the side. I think we are uh, generations, six Irish, uh, Irish six generations back. I think all of Australians have Irish connections somewhere along the line. So, uh, and I'd be delighted to set up some more as a result of this presentation. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? What we're going to do is over the next couple of slides, and there are literally only a few slides here, uh, that the essence is, I hope, going to come out of the discussion. But we're going to talk our motivation and our goals. Why did we actually bother doing this? We all have our day job to do. We're all incredibly busy with our day job. What was so attractive about this project for us. 
Uh, the second thing I, I want to chat about, actually, see that the, the, the slides are a little mixed up here, so I will go through the study by numbers. So uh, this is a, a, a research study, so um, I want to outline the numbers to you uh, just to put it all in perspective, because I do realise coming from different organisations and different setups, um, we may or may not be able to replicate what you do in your own organizations. Hopefully the numbers will put this study in, into perspective for you. We uh, then talk about selecting the modules and how we chose the modules. We have over 7,000 different modules on our system. Um, obviously not all running at the same time, but how did we choose the ones for this particular study? Um, it would be a mammoth study if we tried to study every single module. And indeed, because every lecturer uses Moodle differently, um, some modules aren't necessarily applicable for this study as to how they're used. I then want to go through the interventions and actually show you what the students uh, see and um, what the students uh, came back to us, what they, what they see from us or what message they got from us, and then what they said following the receipt of that message. And uh, if we have time, I'm going to show it from a lecturer's point of view as well, from staff members' point of view. How are we able to channel this information, the same information, but how are we meant to uh, repackage that and make it of interest to the lecturers in there? And uh, like all good things, you hold the best to last. We hold the results until uh, towards the very end and let you know whether we think that the uh, project was worthwhile. Uh, trying not to give anything away, but it was the butler that did it and it was in the lobby. But uh, anybody with a clue or reference will be able to get that one. So um, what's our motivation? Our motivation behind it is to save students. And the image is a tiny little bit dramatic, but let's just put this into perspective. Uh, from my point of view, we are an institution that has 16,000 students. We have um, roughly roughly a 10% uh, dropout rate every year. Now, I, 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 the reasons for dropouts can vary from person to person. In a, in, our, in a separate research study, it's emerged quite a lot of them are dropping out because it was the wrong course choice they made in the first place. However, we do acknowledge that students that want to stay, students that like the course, fail. And um, we want to do everything in our power to try save those students, to try save those students before it's too late. And there's plenty of research that will uh, tell us from the literature that the earlier you uh, try intervene and save the students, the better your chances are of saving the students. Uh, I, I've came across a, a mass lot of research where they say within this first six weeks is crucial time. And the problem that we have is by the time we find out at the end of the year or into the end of the semester, it's way too late by the time we find out that students are struggling. So our motivation is to get data to help us save students. And if I'm looking at it from our, our director of finance point of view, and I do appreciate this may appear a little callous, but it's, it's not meant to be whatsoever, but looking at just the money side of things, each student uh, to us is worth on average 7,000 euros a year uh, because between grants we get from the government and indeed student fees, um, and I, I do appreciate that's, that's pocket change compared to what other um, fees are, are charged in other countries. But for us, 7,000 euros a year. And on average, most students are here for four years. So a student is, is worth, and I, and I use this for, for in, in inverted commas, uh, a student is worth 28,000 euros for us. So our motivation is to save the 28,000 euros. I will add to that, though, and say the societal benefit of keeping students in college, keeping students within Dublin City University, it far outweighs the financial benefit. But at the end of the day, I need to make sure the checks are balanced and the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. So when the money people are asking, why am I doing it? I'm saying it's to save you 28,000 euros. But I'm, I'm driven, I must admit, by the societal benefit. If we save... 10 students, you don't have to be a genius at maths to realize that's over a quarter of a million euros if we save 10 students a year. Um, now we have 16,000 students. So to save 10 should be an easy target for us. So that's our motivation. That's why we want to do this study. 
So let's look at the study and this particular study by numbers. We decided to highlight 17 modules across the university. Now, why did we pick the 17? Well, most of our failure rates are in first year. We reckon, um, and again, a bit of a local term, but we reckon that once a student uh, survives first year, that uh, we pretty much can, are confident we can hold on to them thereafter. Um, so we decided, well, first year is our target audience. We also wanted to choose modules that have a high failure rate. Now, the reason why we wanted to do that is because um, we wanted to be able to measure the before and the after in this research study. So we wanted to be able to say, well, what is the effect of our study? Did our study make a difference? So there's no point in choosing a module that has a high success rate because well, if it had a high success rate before we started and a high success rate after we started, we can't take credit for that. We can't claim that our research was having a positive impact. So we looked at first year modules with a high failure rate. Now, just to explain the next term is to use loop. We uh, have branded loop internally and all of our other learning technologies. So Mahara and um, Adobe Connect or Blackboard or whatever we, uh, we use, we have branded it internally, the whole lot of them under the one umbrella name of loop. So on some of these slides, you may see reference to loop, but for the purpose of this project, it's actually talking about Moodle. So just literally replace the words loop with, with Moodle. So we wanted to make sure they were first year modules, high failure rate, and of course, did they use Moodle? And did they have this periodicity? Could we actually look at the shapes? And, and they say a picture tells a thousand words, and I'll explain periodicity in a picture uh, in a couple of slides time. And uh, the, the last two are important. Did we have stability of content? Because we know that a teacher makes a huge difference. So if it had Joyce teaching at one year, David teaching at the next, and Celine teaching at the, the, the year after, that lack of consistency would actually skew our figures and throw them all over the place. So what we wanted to make sure that it was stable content, but also stable lecture, so we could rule out the teacher influence on the pass rates. And crucially, we needed to have the lecture on board because we operate a principle within DCU that the lecture is in charge of their classroom. As somebody that heads up the teaching and learning unit, I don't um, interfere directly. I'd like to think I assist, but I would definitely not a class for myself as interfering with any of the teaching that goes on. So lecturer is king in his own classroom or, or queen in her own classroom. Um, so that's why we chose 17 modules and we, we, we cut it down to 17 modules initially just to look at. We also had to offer the uh, students the option to opt in or opt out. And that was crucial for us. Um, what we decided to do was uh, we were offering the students the opt in and opt out because then we would be able to compare those that uh, had the intervention and those that didn't and seeing if we could see what uh, we looked for. Looking at that, we were delighted with how this worked. 76% of our students opted in, right? Um, and I'll explain the difference in the cohorts. Again, uh, picture tells a thousand words. I have a slide coming up quite soon. But over 76% opted in. So how did we opt them in? What we did was we put up on the course page, we had conditional access for all of our content on it, and it was conditional on the basis that they had completed a choice activity. And the choice activity is, do you want to opt in or opt out? Now, regardless of the choice, whether it was yes or a no, once they had completed that choice activity, the rest of the course material was made available to them. So students only got to see the course material if they made that choice. And before making that choice, we had put at the top of the course content, we put a video explaining it. It had one of my colleagues uh, explaining how we use the data and what we want to use it for. And we also put up a word version, what we call a plain language statement of it. So the student was first greeted by the video and the word document and then the choice activity. And when they made the choice activity, um, the rest of their course content, whether it's biology, maths, chemistry, physics, it didn't matter. It was all revealed to them. And they also had the choice to opt in or opt out at any stage throughout the semester. So that 
in, in Moodle terminology, the ability to update their choice was available to them for the entire semester. And the, the final point here is we actually said to the students, we sent them an email and I'll get into the details of the email later on, but we sent them an email every single week to let them know how they were doing. And we sent out over 10,000 emails to nearly 1,200 students over the 13 weeks. So uh, that's, that's the study by numbers, essentially, just to, to, to uh, try add some statistics into it and put it into context. But what did it actually look like? And here's where the, 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 the pretty pictures come up. But what did we measure? We measured the total Moodle activity. So um, I do appreciate that slide may be a little bit small to see. So I'm just going to talk you through it. Um, we measured that year on year. We measured it in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. And the, the slide isn't big enough to show you, but we went the whole way up to 2014 and 15. <clears throat> we measured every single click across the entire Moodle site. And I can nearly feel people looking at it and trying to interpret it a little bit more. So I'm going to give you a little help here. If we look at the 2009, we can actually determine, uh, looking at the calendar year, when the students started the semester, the initial enthusiasm for it, then the drop off during the holidays, then the peak back up before the first semester exams, then our semester exams draw, uh, finish on our, our holidays, and then we kick off back into semester two. And again, you can, you can map it very, very clearly. You can map it across the calendar year. And what we found was we were getting this, what we termed periodicity. You could literally notice key periods throughout the year being replicated every single year. Now, you will notice, and I was thrilled to actually see this, that the total, and remember this is every click a student takes, the total number of clicks is increasing year on year and that's because our Moodle usage was increasing and that's a presentation for an entirely different day. But I was delighted to see this because it was uh, quite crudely when everybody else was saying the VLE is dead and the VLE doesn't work anymore, I was actually able to see people are using the VLE more and looking at the analytics a little bit more, I was able to see they were using more of the activities than they were just being a content-driven course. But for the purpose of this presentation, what I want you to note is the periodicity every single year. Now, this is every single course. So what does one course look like? Here's one particular module. Again, you can see peak times, and we can map this to when uh, an assignment is due or when the final exam is due and so on. Um, and this is one particular module that we're looking at. So what we decided to do with all of this data, and remember, we have so much data um, to look at. How are we going to incorporate this in or combine this with other data? So I want to put the other data into perspective, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So we have age, we have demographic data, we have academic performance, we have physical behavior and online behavior. But we decided to look at just looking at the demographics, the age, the home address, um, and the access to the VLE. And we looked at when they access the VLE. Now, we do have other projects going on that looks at Wi-Fi and looks at library access and clubs and society engagement and so on. But for the purpose of this, we concentrated on the demographics. We had to concentrate on the age because we could only, for legal reasons, um, involve uh, adults in the study and in Ireland some students can be under the age of 18 depending on what age they, they uh, start and leave school at <clears throat> and we looked at the home address uh, sorry their term address to see did that have any influence on how they engaged and I was delighted to say that didn't have any access so then we're right back down or sorry any influence we're right back down to the access record so how many times they clicked on uh, Moodle, okay? So now, <clears throat> that's the data that we looked at. So what we had was, when we were looking at uh, 09, 010, and uh, um, 11 and 12 data, right? We used that as training data to build classifiers, to build algorithms 
to analyze the student activity. And what we did was, knowing the final results of the students in 20, uh, 09, 10, 11, and 12, and we also had the advantage of knowing the final results of those in 2013, we tried to build algorithms on the historical data, looking at the 2013 as uh, we, we mocked that up as live data, um, and we said, can we predict how they would perform in the end of semester exams based on historical data? So we would say, Celine, you uh, performed, you engaged with the VLE uh, very well this month. Based on your current level of engagement, we predict you will do well in this module. Or we would say, Lewis, your level of engagement with this module was quite low. Um, based on records from students in previous years, unless you improve, your chances of failure are quite high. Um, so that's it. Yeah, I'm sorry, Lewis. But, uh, I, I know Celine was a much better student. <clears throat> but uh, that, that's essentially what we were able to uh, get across. Okay, that's, that's what we were testing. And um, we, because we had the final results of the 2013 students, we were actually able to see where our predictions accurate. So what we did was we used historical data to train our algorithms and to test our classifiers. Does, does that make sense? I'm seeing a couple of nods, yeah? Yes, it does, great stuff. Okay, um, <clears throat> so what did we do? Once we trained this data, we need to figure out, well, what worked well, right? What we found, as I said, we, we, we started off with thousands of modules, obviously cut them down because we were just looking at first year as opposed to all years, but then we had so many other different modules. So the modules that worked well was those that had periodicity. Remember that, that repeatable um, pattern every single year. Um, what modules worked well is this, these algorithms, right? <clears throat> if they're the confidence in predictors, now I, I don't claim to be a statistician. This is where, as I, I alluded to earlier on, the brains of, of the number crunching came from other people. Uh, but I will try my best to explain the, the, the aspects of it. But we wanted the, the confidence to increase over time. So as the weeks went on in the semester, we wanted our predictions to become more accurate. And we wanted to have... Um, well, not high success rates, not necessarily limiting it to high failure rates, but we didn't want the pass rates to be high because we wanted to be able to prove, as I said earlier on, we want to be able to prove that our intervention was making a difference. And the obvious statement really, but I have to include it, is we must have large numbers of students because the more data we have, the, the higher the chances that our predictions will be, will be correct. Because we were dealing with first-year students, inevitably we had a, a large number of students in there. So that's what made a module look well, or that's what the, the characteristics would be of a, a, um, a module, okay? So let's look at the, um, the people that participated versus those that didn't participate. And for the benefit of people, and I know we said earlier on that everybody is Irish somewhere and possibly even six or seven generations back, but for those not familiar with the Irish education system, we have a final, a state exam that is given to all students in and around the age of 18 by the time they leave uh, second level schools uh, before they enter university. Uh, so it's a common exam across the entire country. And each... Um, each result that they get, they typically study six or seven different subjects, and each result that they get is worth a certain amount of points to get them into college. And these are what's called your CAO points. So you would get 60 points for an A, and you get 50 points for a B, and uh, 40 for a C, and so on. Um, and if you study a subject at higher level versus at, at ordinary level, you get more points for an A at higher level than you would get for an A at ordinary level. But it all builds up into this complicated point system. But what it allows us to do is actually measure the total number of points. So it's a, a pseudo measurement, albeit quite a weak one, but a pseudo measurement of a student's academic ability before they come in. 
So remember I said to you we use conditional activities to ask students and choice activities to opt in and to opt out. So we asked the students, uh, or we sorry, we looked at the, the academic indicator, the number of CAO points, number of points they get in this final state exam. Uh, we looked at that for the participants versus the non-participants. And what we're able to see, the blue and the red line, um, what we're able to see is actually the profile is very, very similar. And the key term in here, I know they're not exactly the same, I do appreciate that, but the difference is there's no significant statistical difference between the two cohorts. So quite bluntly, explaining it to an, a non-statistics person like me, quite bluntly, it means they are equally intelligent, right? Um, the second graph on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, we actually took one specific subject. Elsie is leaving certificate, by the way. Uh, we took the maths subject because other studies, both on inside and outside Dublin City University, have indicated that uh, not only is the points uh, um, uh, an accurate um, indicator of somebody Um, Mark, for some reason your sound seems to have disappeared. Uh, maybe if you turn it off and on, <laughs> it's a typical IT thing to say, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, we'll see if we could, might have to reload back into the room. We'll see how we go. Um, just take your time.
sorry folks uh, i'm not sure if you can hear me now, but it's connecting on the next slide my, my apologies about that oh good we can hear you that's fantastic yay all right sorry we'll continue. we've all had a weather chat so you can always chat about the weather a weather chat <laughs> chat about the weather oh. always something <laughs> well the weather is always better in australia than it is in ireland but we won't even go there so um, my apologies about that, folks. So where did we go from? We, we basically said that, they, just to, to recap very quickly on the last, year, our student cohort were the same. Academically wise, they were the same. Uh, they had the same ability. We didn't just get a bias of our, our students. So uh, we looked at one particular module and we built what's called a predictor curve. Now, this is not a probability. I, I must stress this, and again, I will say that I'm not a statistician in the audience. This was the, the, uh, the rest of the team. But just to explain this curve to you, on the, the uh, axis on the bottom here, on the x-axis, it literally was going, uh, here's week 5, week 10, week 15, week 20, and so on. And here on the y-axis, we had to predict our confidence. Now, the key value... The key value for us is to get a value of both 0.6. Now, 0.6 is here, okay? 0.6 is here on the graph. Now, as we can see, the, the value for the predictor value went above 0.6 at roughly week 12. Now, that's absolutely great at week 12 if it was a 28-week module. If if it's a 12-week module, well, then it's absolutely useless to us. But these were the, the predictor curves that we were able to say. And, and again, to explain this in English for, for the benefit of people like me who doesn't have a statistics background, any prediction I made after week 12 to this student was accurate. There was a 95.9% .9 chance of the um, prediction coming true. So uh, 0.6 is our magic figure. This is no good to us, as I say, if it was a 12-week module. If it's a year-long module, we're finding out after 12 weeks. That's absolutely brilliant, right? Let's look at a different module here. So the same, same things on, on the, the x-axis, we have the weeks, and on the y-axis, we have this predictor value. So here is incredibly important because we go above 0.6 with the odd blip in here and there, but we go above 0.6 after week four. So the students are only in to door a wet day. They still have memories of our summer holidays at this stage. And based on their interactions, we can predict whether they're going to pass. Now, the old way that we would uh, see if the students were struggling was the end of semester exams or the end of year exams. Whereas now we are able to predict from week four in this module. All right. Now, of course, what did we do when we have this information? That's the key bit. And loads of people say about ethics and the problem with uh, having the student data and is it ethical collecting all this data. I would actually be of the belief if we have data to help a student that will help a student and we don't give it to them, I think that's unethical. But again, I'll, I'll have a fist fight with anybody in between that. I'll get on my soapbox uh, and say that. But I'm all for the students and trying to help them improve. So here's a selection of other modules, the same graph. So again, periodicity, or sorry, weeks on, on the x-axis and the values, uh, I just realized here in the slide, the value of 0.6 didn't come across too early, but a value of 0.6 is, is here. So when we map across for all of the modules, the, the least uh, module or one we find out latest is at week four. All the rest of them we can actually find out on week three, it goes above 0.6. So exactly, Maureen, you're right. Generally, the predictions are quite good quite early on in the semester. What I will say to you is these are predictors if nothing else happens. If the student continues on the road, they are going down. Is it going to matter whether they're going to fail? All right. We decided to give this data back to the students, right? We decided, well, we're looking at these modules. And we're saying, well, what's so different about these modules versus others? And can I look at them? This is me being selfish here now uh, as, as a teaching and learning person. Look at the modules and see, well, what are they doing in these modules that actually make these predictions so accurate so early in the semester? 
So we looked at all the different features of Moodle. Uh, we looked at workshops and wikis and forms and assignments and everything that was in there. And we said, well, looking at these, most of these courses are actually what I would call content-driven courses, right? Content-driven insofar as they are putting up the lectures, putting up a, a, a Word document or a PDF or a PowerPoint or even maybe a SCORM object or, or, or a URL. But I wanted them to be doing wikis and I wanted them to be doing forms and I wanted them to be doing stuff more interactive. But this is the characteristics I came back with, right? But what did I do with all this data? What did I do with this predictor data? What I did was I sent it back to the students. And I'll give you a second to read that email. But as, as you're reading it, and it's a generic email which we were able to send out, but we were able to personalize it um, by, literally, it was a mail merge. And they got this, this, uh, this generic email to them, <coughs> and it gave them points of contact. And uh, if they didn't want to contact a lecture, they could contact Alan or Sinead, and, and we could go on from there. But we decided to split it up. And we, we took half of our students that opted in and we gave them this email. And the other half, we gave them an image that is, so do you know the way a picture tells a thousand words? So we gave them this image that we would have on a student dashboard. Now we decided, and admittedly money was our driver here, we didn't have the money to do this. We were going to develop a dashboard for the students and show them this information. Uh, in a graphic and that's essentially what we did in the email we showed them the graphic that we would eventually use or wanted to use as a student dashboard so we had two groups remember those that opted in and those that opted out and our second group ended up saying uh the group those that opted in sorry uh we split them in two where we said some gets an email and the others get an email and an image and the image was this the image was based on the interactions, the historical interactions of the class. Your chances of passing, you need to have interactions more than this level here. The average or the median level of interactions within your class is here, and you're here. You're doing quite well. So, Celine, this is you based on the example I was given earlier on. All right. So, that was the image that was also embedded in the email. We wanted to improve that. We wanted to improve that, and this is what we put in this year, and we used Amazon as our inspiration because we were able to say, and let's, let's go back to Lewis earlier on, we were able to say, Lewis, based on your interactions, you're doing quite poor, but here are resources that your colleagues have looked at, and we were able to specifically look at resources that high-performing students had clicked on or most of the class had clicked on that, in this case, Lewis hadn't. So we used that information within the email and it gave them a link directly to uh, those resources. And time to get reading, Lewis. Yeah, you're dead right. I'm so glad you have a sense of humor. I really should have checked out. I used it beforehand. Um, so what did our students say, right? So we took a survey of over 100 students um, that came back, or over 100 students responded, excuse me, came back. And remember, uh, Loop, just in case you come across, that's Moodle for the purpose of this presentation. So we had group one, which got the email and the image, and group two just got the email. Now, the key uh, bits to look at is the percentage of students that changed how they use Moodle as a result of getting these weekly emails. So over 40% of them who got the image said, it changed the way I use Moodle for other subjects, not just the ones I was getting the email for. Um, how many of them said they take part again? over 70% of both cohorts, over 70%. And they, this is the strongly agree, will take part and agree, and this is the strongly agree and agree. So it's quite a high percentage of students liked getting this information. Of those that said, remember I said 33% changed how they would use Moodle, they studied more, they read more articles online, they wrote up more notes, they used Loop more because they tried to engage with their, uh, their modules more. Now, some of them did turn around and say, uh, I only looked at it because I now know my lecturer's looking. Now, the lecturer wasn't looking. This was a computer that was looking and doing all that information, right? Um, and again, here, here's that particular quote from a student. I realized that since teachers knew how much it was I was using Loop, I had to try and maintain... Uh, 
pages as long so I could actually look at it. So there were students that were trying to game the system, but that's inevitable. That's what's going to happen. So what did we show the lectures? We showed the lectures, the, and this is a list of student names and numbers it's purposely blurred out. Um, but what we had here was a color coded chart that gave the lectures a very visual indication. Students that had blue, they weren't, uh, they were top of the class in terms of their interaction. Student that had red were students at risk. And the lecturer through this system was able to uh, isolate those that were doing consistently poor and actually target interventions with those. And you'd obviously look and see, well, those that started off at blue and then faded down into red, they're ones I really need to start to rescue. Maybe those that were red, there's no hope for them overall. Or maybe those that were red and then became blue as against, they're the good students because they've started to engage more. So we presented this information to, uh, to lectures, and we also did it on a on a uh, more individual basis. So you could actually look up one student's individual interactions versus the average interactions for that module, and then this student's interactions for that module. And this is for the the student's mentor or the course coordinator. They could see well, this student is doing particularly well. Here's the average, and this student is up here. So well done, pat on the back, and so on. That got us thinking and we were thinking, what other Moodle data could we use? So we went into the assessment data and whether they had submitted on time or missed a deadline and then the relative grades that they got. A mass load of data that we could get, right? Well, let's cut to the chase. I'm conscious of my time here. What's the difference in the final grades? And the difference is quite clear. <clears throat> uh, the first set of figures there were have non-participant, those that did not get those weekly emails, with or without the images, those that did not get those emails versus those that did. So if we're looking at um, B101, there's a 4% increase, 3.5% increase in grades, 2% increase in grades. There's two of them that actually drop in grades. Most of them increase in grades. And those that are green are statistically significant differences. Look at this, maths, the second last one, a 9% increase in grades based on the interaction. So that actually made us think, that made us think we are making a difference. Now we looked at the same thing in the second semester and we didn't see any difference. Now we didn't see any negative difference, which is also good, but actually from, from evaluating with the students, we came to the conclusion that we actually trained them well to use Moodle in the first semester, that then no matter how much we were emailing them, they were using it anyway. And that's, that's where we're at, folks. That's, that's, that's the uh, story. We looked at the, the course content again for each one of those courses, seen if it would make a difference. But the challenge that we came up against, and we are trying to address this, challenge. Well, course LG116 had 500 Word documents on it. I'm making that up, by the way, but 500 Word documents. Um, so, but how many of them were active? How many of them were just put up there years and years ago by the lecturer and he was too lazy to delete them down? So we're now looking at a way to measure the active content over the, the period of years, the active discussion forms, the active um, uh, wikis and so on and to look at it that way so so this kind of true us off and someone is going to is this the hawthorne effect very very valid question uh russell and for those that are familiar is it essentially because people know you're go, you're being looked at you change your behavior and then that wears off after a while um yeah very very true uh the hawthorne effect could have an influence on it but the positive bit is they improved their engagement and improved their grades and all we're doing is we're doing this study in first semester. So if we can convince them in first semester to change the grades and we save them by the end of first semester, because remember, these students were dropping out and we were losing them. And if the Hawthorne effect is having an influence, yeah, so be it. I won't, won't rule it out. I'd like to say it's more than just a Hawthorne effect. But um, we're saving the students. We're not monitoring them in second, third and fourth year. Maybe we should. Maybe that's a follow-on for this, uh, this study. So uh, just Russell, after 10 weeks, you think their new habits would be pretty well established. That's, that's it in a nutshell. 
that's that's it. We think that we've uh, we've got them into good habits, you know. Um, what what we need to do now is improve the way we analyze our course content and then map that back now to improving course design. Because if we can prove that, well, this is very content heavy, can I make it more collaborative? Can I make it more interactive? Maybe a more interactive course, the ones where you're encouraging student engagement will lead to better students. Active learning, yeah, exactly. Um, this is what we're trying to look at. But our challenge is, because there's so much historical content in there, I don't know how much of that is active because the lecturer's course is theirs. Uh, I can look into it, all right, but I have no idea that the lecturer put up all of this content just as extra reading. But the core material is the active material. So it is something that we are, are seriously investigating. We're actually looking, if I have time here to um, click in, sorry, we're looking at content transfer. We're measuring courses in four different categories. Is it just a content based? Is it an assessment based, an interaction based, or a collaboration based? And if we're looking at collaboration, well, does it have a whole load of chats or forms or wikis or glossaries? And then we have the number of chats that are here, but then these are the ones that are active this semester. Um, so we're looking at that, we're building a plugin. Um, to analyze this and uh, most of our plugins we have we have a consortium of colleges where we share our plugins uh because obviously we all can't afford to be um doing everything but at the same extent you just practically can't so we just don't have the resources there's only four of us in our team we don't have the resources to be supporting the development of plugins um for the entire community so we share our plugins with our consortiums and what we're able to do is um, get feedback from people on saying, well, what should we measure with this with this uh, plugin and how should we improve it? And, and this is these are the results we're coming up with. And I hope that it's data that can be replicated in other institutions. There is an article, uh, I will say it's out of date, uh, which is very shocking to say. Um, but the the uh, the URL is predictedanalysis.wordpress.com. Uh, uh, predicted analytics, excuse me. Wordpress.com. I'm just going to uh, type it in here and and the uh, messaging just to to make sure we get it. Yeah, it gives a little bit of information, uh, and I, it is on my to do list to actually update it. But here it is there. And it will have contact details if anybody wants to do a similar or set up a relationship. I'd be delighted. It was helping us look at course design first. The consent procedure, actually, we were, we were thrilled with how it worked. Very, very simple. Uh, students opted in. And because they had the choice to opt in and opt out at any stage, we didn't close that choice activity. It was a no-brainer. We did have students come up to us and say, oh, I tried to access my course material and couldn't. Uh, you couldn't because you didn't answer the choice. And it's up there quite clearly. So we found having the video uh, there for the students was a big help. Also, we were able to track them because we put the video up on YouTube. We were able to track the analytics associated with that. And when did students stop paying attention in video? Um, and it will help us now modify the video for next year to be clearer um, and hopefully make it easier for the students. Sorry, I'm just going to have to jump in here very quickly because I need to go to another room. But yeah. um, you can keep talking. Don't think you can't not keep chatting. Don't, don't um, say that to an Irishman. I know. <laughs> As I said earlier, my parents are Irish, oh, and trust me, I have that too. Um, anyone who knows me is probably laughing their heads off at the moment, knowing that I'm always good for a chat. Um, but uh, thank you so much. That was brilliant, and we got so much from it, and obviously so many questions. As I said, you can keep going with your questions. 
Um, or if you have questions maybe later, you can hop into the forums and have a chat with each other that way. That would be fantastic. But I'm just quickly popping off now and saying thank you so much for participating and it was awesome. And we'll, um, don't forget, if you missed part of this or thought somebody else should see it, that it will be repeated on another day. So you've got a chance to see it again. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, Wendy. And sorry to everybody about the technical uh, glitches there. My apologies.